Welcome everyone, and I hope everybody is having an amazing afternoon. On the same note, I would like to take this moment to thank Shona and every single person that is joining us, because I know everybody's busy, but you took your lunch time to be present in this lunch and learn. So thank you very much. I also want to remind everyone that this lunch and learn is brought to you by family partners of Morris and Sussex counties. And this is your host, Patricia Houston. And without further note, I welcome Family Partners FSP and CQI, Shona Gregory. Welcome, Shona. Wow, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I have been asked to speak by my director uh, about some of the services that are provided by the Family Support Organization, you know, and how I became involved with the FSO. Uh, and I just, tell you the truth, I became involved to go on a mission. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited to be here, very. And, and we are very happy, Shona, to have you, definitely, for sure. We are very happy, because we know a lot of families are gonna benefit from uh, the information that you're gonna be sharing today. And this is the reason as to why we are doing this. So thank you again. So Shona, um, we have a lot to cover. So how do you want to start? Because we want to cover everything, and, but I know everybody also is eager to hear about his story. So right. this is what I'm thinking. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Shona, the person before having children and the struggles that Shona went through at that time. Then we're going to move to Shona, the mother of a youth or actually a child because she was six, right? Yes. Um, yeah, so then we're gonna move to that. Uh, so you're gonna explain a little bit about uh, that journey. And then we're gonna move to Shona, Sh Shona, the grandmother raising children. And after that, we're gonna finish it with Shona, the person that we are seeing today. So Shona, let's talk about how everything started before having children. Well, Pat, on February the 9th of 1992 was mm -hmm. my first date of sobriety. I had a very severe drinking problem. So, of course, when my daughter started displaying challenging behaviors, uh, I was kind of surprised because I was sober by the time she was six. And... Um, so I didn't want to talk about anything, you know, I didn't want to tell anybody, you know, what was going on with me because I was more concerned with somebody trying to figure out what was going on with her. So <laughs> I went to everybody under the sun to try to figure it out, but there was no, um, th these services that you have available to you now were not available to me then. Um, so, you know, being that alcoholic and, and, and being in a, an extremely abusive relationship, it was, every, everything was tight-lipped. I, I couldn't talk outside of myself. I, I, I lived in a bubble, quite honestly. Wow, Sean. And this is the reason why we are doing this today, because we know there are a lot of caregivers out there that might have a child or a youth or children in general, you know, with challenges. And they are struggling themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, having a child. Let's talk about Shona, Shona the mother of yeah. the youth with challenges. Let's oh boy, that's the, that's the big piece. Um, at the age of six, um, Tiffany started to just displaying some very uh, awkward, behaviors. Now, because I was a year of being sober when she was six, I would watch every little thing she would do. I mean, I would stare at her like you wouldn't believe. I just, I was intrigued with this adorable little girl. And one day I was walking past her room and she was tearing all the heads off of her teddy bears, punching walls, throwing chairs all over the place. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I hate them. And she starts screaming and into a frantic. And I said, okay, I ignored it, went 
back into my room and let her throw her tangent. The next day she went to school and uh, told her teachers that she wanted to kill herself. She didn't wanna be here on this earth anymore. And so they called me up and they told me that and I go down there and I walk in there and there is the Division of Family and Youth Services, the police, the sheriff. It, it was like a million people there. Um, talk about intimidating. I didn't know what to say or do. So I just kind of stood there like the pink elephant on the wall trying to figure out what in the heck is going on. Right. And now they're asking me questions about me. Well, I want to talk about her. They wouldn't let me go into the room with her which for the life of me, I didn't understand. Um, and I could hear her in there screaming, they beat me, they hate me. I just, I, when I say going out, I could not. And I'm like, what are they doing to her? And I'm, and I'm panicked. And they're asking me, uh, is, uh, is your husband at home and does he beat her? And I'm like, okay, that's enough. So you have to understand now, being that recovered alcohol, you don't want to talk. You don't want to say, oh, I had an alcohol. You don't want to tell them nothing because you're scared they're going to take not just that child, but by then I had a small child too. Wow. Yeah. Wow, Shona. And I mean, Shona, um, I have a question. Um, when, when everything started, uh, she had any diagnosis or not yet? Oh, Pat, no. The incident from the school took her into a hospital for three full months to give her an evaluation. And by the time she came out of the hospital, she had three different diagnoses. And which was, of course, I was not involved with mental health. So I didn't know, I was clueless, blindsided uh, by some of the things that they were saying. And, now they're telling me she's hearing voices. And then they said she's schizophrenic, but you can't say that until she's 18. So they had all these things they were saying. And of course they were trying all kinds of different medications to calm her down because trust me, when she was in this hospital, she gave them a run for their money. I mean, she, I don't, she, she took plastic knives and started cutting her wrist out of nowhere. I want everybody to understand that this came at, six years old out of absolutely nowhere. There was no warning signs, there was nothing. Just all of a sudden, boom. And then it went from there. Wow, yeah. And I'm assuming, um, you know, that those behaviors also were affecting the whole family as a whole, right? Oh my God. Hey, there, there was no such thing as family. I had a young baby at home. I had my Ashley. She was my youngest daughter. I, I literally, the neighbors raised her because I spent from the age of six to the age of 18 in and out of hospitals with Tiffany. So I didn't have time with my younger child. So, and, and I, I see that, you know, sometimes a parent can struggle with that is the guilt. Mm -hmm. Like I have a child and I'm guilty. You know, I'm spending hours, like up to 20 to 22 hours in a hospital waiting for her to get a bed to be transferred to another hospital. There's no such thing as dinner. You don't. You, and that's why we are having this type of conversation because especially we see sometimes like, uh, oh, the child or the youth has been hospitalized or something like that. But tell me about that experience. Like the first time that you had to take your child to the hospital because oh, of behavior. I sat in a hospital room for 22 hours. The minute we walked in, by then she had pulled all of her braids out of her hair. She was looking like really looking crazy. Sitting in the hallway, screaming and yelling. They have a security guard blocking me. They're, they're, they're watching me and my reactions. And I'm watching her because I'm in shock. And here they come with food to feed her and some crowns and they're pacifying her. And I'm sitting there, I'm starving, mind you. I literally starving. Um, there's nowhere for me to get anything to eat. And I just sat and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking in my mind is, is she doing this to get attention? You know, at first is what I thought. 
So they take her into another room with a, with a psychiatrist by herself. I'm still sitting in the waiting room. Now, mind you, with a six-year-old, you can't leave that hospital. You can't go and get yourself a bite to eat. No, because there's you have to be there for your child. So I'm, I'm saying, well, is there anybody here that could grab me something to eat? And their resp response was, well, can you have somebody bring you something? But yeah, they can bring me something, but how do they get it to me? Because they can't come in there either. So you just, you're lost. That's all I could say, completely lost. Yeah, because I do remember uh, when we had this conversation, you mentioned it, uh, that you have also a baby at home, right? Yeah. Yeah, I had a little baby at home and a, a home cooked meal came from <clears throat> the woman down the street, the lady next door, <laughs> the woman across the street there. Everybody under the sun would feed her. In fact, I belonged to a church at the time and they would bring meals and drop them off at my house for my daughter because my dad lived downstairs. Now, my dad is older, so he was downstairs and I lived upstairs. So she would be upstairs by herself, but there's an adult in the house. I had a husband. He was not worth one cent to the side of a circle. He was very uncompassionate. He, he couldn't understand, yeah, nothing wrong with her. She just nuttier than a bug. And like, these are the kind of things that I had to deal with. I had to deal with that at the hospital, what was going on. I had to deal with the fact that I have a young baby at home. She wasn't even three. She was two and a half who... And, and I, I couldn't function. I mean, I literally couldn't function. And, and that's the reason I also want to ask you the next question, uh, because I, uh, we're going to go a little back to when we started. Uh, she was the thing, the house, uh, you know, and also a punching holes and all of that. Would you please go over into those behavior and explain a little bit more so far other families can identify themselves and see that, you know, uh, there are behaviors sometimes that we don't have control over and we just have to have faith that we're going to make it through. Yeah, and, and in a million years, you would not imagine that the destruction that happened in my home, like every room in my house had holes in the walls, every room. In fact, I had bought, uh, had per, actually had a, a table and chair made for her. Uh, it was the cutest little wooden table and chairs you've ever seen in your life. And her name was written on the back of the chairs because I loved her the way she spelled her name. And she literally put one of those chairs through the wall, one of them through the window. It, it, it literally, when I had to sell my house eventually, it literally was over $100,000 worth of damage. And um, I fortunately met this contractor who my dad knew very well. And um, he came, when he came into my life, finally, um, he fixed the house back up, but still, you know, you, you have to try to figure out what is the plan here? What, 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 do we, what do we do with all these holes in the wall? And it, it wouldn't just be the fact that it looked bad because it really looked bad, but it would be for the fact that she would sometimes put holes to the extent of rain, if it rained or snowed, it would dampen the outside of the house that would seep inside. And of course, what would happen? Mold. Wow. It was a nightmare. That's all I could say. And this is not an old house. This was a new house. This was a house that my parents built for me. Imagine that. Yeah. And Shona, and, um, tell us a little bit about your experience going food shopping with oh, a child no. with challenges. And we kind of trying to kind of fit, you know, yeah. fit everything right here. Yeah, tell us about that experience. Yeah. You, don't, you don't want to know about that. You know, going to the grocery store, I got to tell you though, at some of the times throughout when I was going with through her, I did have some people that were involved with us. <clears throat> There's one woman who would come over. She was one of Tiffany's mentors. She would come uh, once a week for a couple hours a day. And so it got to the point where you couldn't go grocery shopping. I mean, talk about a meltdown. She would get in the grocery store, dump everything off the shelf, scream, yell. I mean, it was bad. It was real bad. So when she said, well, what can I help you with? I said, come to the grocery store with me. Come to my church with me. You know, you, you coming here isn't helping me because she would come. And the minute she would get there, Tiffany would leave the house. Like she would literally buck out of the house. 
So she would start going to the grocery store with us. And I got to tell you that, uh, that this was recent. I saw a, a young child in a grocery store having a major meltdown, major. He was really having a meltdown. And all I could remember, it keeps your memory green, everybody, is looking into the face of the, the parent. And I turned around and looked at her. I said, are you okay? Now she's looking at the child like everybody else in the store was. And she said, are, are you talking to me? I said, yeah, are you okay? Give me a hug. And she literally started crying. And you have to understand when children have these meltdowns in the store, and I wanna encourage everybody in this room is, is when that child is having that meltdown in the store, don't, don't go and look at the child and, oh, he's being so bad. No, look at that parent and give them some support because they are going through it. If it's happening in the store, imagine what's happening in the home. And Shona, um, I know we also discussed, um, you know, so I just want you to share if you feel comfortable. If not, we can continue. Uh, because you also were struggling with alcohol. I mean, you have already, yeah, you know, been through all of that. But then after that was depression. Um, would you please uh, talk to us a little bit about how that journey looked like for a caregiver having depression, and also having to deal with a child with challenges. Yeah. Tell us about, yeah. Yeah, who, who knew? It, it, you know, I, I actually started writing the book, Tiffany's Song, because I had to heal. Like I had a child with challenges. I had an abusive husband. I was so depressed sometimes. I would literally just cry myself to sleep. There was, there was no such thing as, oh, get a counselor. Because of course, I'm nervous to get a counselor. I go tell a counselor something, they might call the state and take my baby and my Tiffany from me. So I'm scared to do that. So what did I do? I sat down and I started writing a series of books. And no matter what anybody says in here, you can't make this stuff up. Like you cannot make this stuff up. I have a series of seven books that I have been writing since 2006. I can't stop writing. And that's why they're not all completed. Because every time I get to just about the end of one book, I remember, oh, this has to go in this book. This has to go. So I go back and forth. Tiffany's song, by the way, is being edited as we speak. And it's, uh, it has taken some time. But the book isn't for the general audience. The book is for you. It is for everybody in this room so that you could understand, start writing, you know, journalize everything. It, you, this way it helps you to remember the things that happened and you can share it. Uh, parents can't function without somebody to talk to. Not everybody is comfortable talking to a therapist. Yes. And, and, that's, uh, and that's another reason as to why we continue having this type of conversation because we know that there are a lot of families out there that they might be struggling and they don't know what to do and it's okay to reach out for support reach out to community resources available don't stay alone just because you feel that nobody can help please reach out um shona and now that we are talking about that um because I know like I want you to go back a little bit uh, in relation as to why you had to change your name because I want people to know that it, it wasn't not it was not only a caregiver trying to raise a child with challenges, but you also was the mother trying to survive and make it through life. So would you please, Shona? Thank you, Pat. Thank no, you thank so you. much. Um this I'm sorry. Um I had my daughter who was extremely emotional all the time. Sorry. Um, you know, it, it's, it's nice to say I can read excerpts from my book, but then I have to relive of those experiences. So like I said a while ago, I was in a very abusive relationship. I mean, I couldn't open my mouth. I lived in a bubble. I really did. 
And so I'd filed for divorce. Once that happened, he became a stalker. He blew up my dog house. He'd come and park in his car in the front of my house and show a moon to me in, in my windows and scream and yell, beep his horn three and four o'clock in the morning. This is all while there is a restraining order. So now the court date came. The court date was February the 28th. It was on a leap year, 2006. And we go to court and he gets up in front of the judge and tells the judge, when we're finally divorced, I'm gonna kill her. So at that instance, I was already set and planning to move because he had taken the house that my parents built for me from me. Equitable distribution, everybody. And I was set to be leaving the house on March the 1st and turning the house over to a new owner. And so the judge looks out at all of us and asks us what they suggested to do. And I said, I wanna put in for a name change and I need to redo myself. So the judge said, we will, we will come back on the 1st of March and we will finalize the divorce. Okay, I'm all excited. Well, on March the 1st, he died of a heart attack. And so I didn't become that widow. I became, uh, I did not become that divorced person. I became a widow on that day. Well, with that, I had already moved. I literally fled immediately, had just got my name changed. And there you have it. He's gone. I can breathe. Wrong. Three months later, I hear a voice behind me and it sounded like him. And that was it. I couldn't function for years. It took me three years to start coming back out because I realized, okay, he really is gone. But if I hear that, that sound, or even if I see somebody that might look like him, it's still very scary. So, you know, with that, three years after, you know, he died, I found my voice. I found out who I was for real. And um, so I had come to FSO, but I couldn't start writing my book. You know, I couldn't do that, not with him alive. But uh, that's when I started finding my voice and now I can't shut up. You know, it, it, it's really hard to shut up. I've actually uh, went under the judge honorable adults in Somerset County at one time to talk to juvenile justice, young, young men that were um, in this juvenile justice system for domestic violence and letting them see the impact. And every last one of them sat in there and cried. And they all had plenty of questions afterwards. And, and I pray that all those young men got a gist of me because by then I was bitter and angry. The court system couldn't help me. Nobody could keep him away from me. And he had purchased a gun and let us know. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. Sorry about all of that. That's really yeah. much because I know, you know, this moment uh, for you to be here with us, you know. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Shona, um, yesterday we also discussed because you mentioned it in the middle of everything. And like I said, we are trying to cover everything right here. But in the middle of everything, I believe you mentioned it, it was the school or one of the providers that was working with uh, Tiffany uh, mentioned it that she was depressed. And we had this conversation yesterday, like, okay, if your child is telling you that he or she is depressed, or probably he or she might not use the term depressed, but if you notice that something is off, uh, Shona, can you please tell us what to do? Yes, yes. Because when I had that counselor tell me she was depressed, what does she have to be depressed about? You know, I got to pay the bills, right? I got to get up and go to work. Depressed, she don't even know what depressed is. She doesn't know what that word means. She said, well, that's not exactly what she said. What she said is she doesn't want to be here anymore. 
and that she's very unhappy. I said, well, me too. Welcome to the club. I had just lost my best friend, uh, my, my, my late husband's mother. I, I mean, I had three deaths in a row within a month and she's depressed. So then it dawned on me, maybe these are the things that are affecting her. We start looking for reasons, you know, why they're not happy. But you know what? You're never going to find them unless you have the opportunity that I do. My daughter, Tiffany, is still with us. She is 36. And she tells me now in my life, in the excerpts of the book, what she was feeling. And I got to say right now, she is doing wonderful. Like she lights up my life every time I have the opportunity to speak to her on the phone. There was a time in my life when I thought I would walk in her room and she would be dead on the floor. There were so many suicide attempts. When your child tells you, make this, I can't make this any more clear, that they're unhappy, or if there's something going on in their life that they just are struggling and they can't handle, listen to them and believe them. Because I tell you, I didn't. I, these services were not out there. I did not believe anybody under the sun to tell me that this little girl was depressed. Because for me, I couldn't see a reason why she was depressed. She had a state of the arts bedroom and anything under the sun she wanted. I had a very good job, by the way, which is hard to keep when you have a child with challenges. How do you, how do you take off? Oh, listen, I got to leave early. Uh, my daughter's got to be hospitalized. Yeah, right. Then the next day you come dragging in there looking like who did it and left because you've been up all night. You're starving, you can't function. Then you get to work and you fall asleep at your desk. It was a tough time for me, but I made it. And so will all of you. Yes, yes. And, and that's, uh, Bishona, another point that I would like you to talk is about when she took your other daughter medication. Oh, Tell us about that story. You, you don't want me to talk about that. So we want we, families to know, definitely. We, we talked about, you know, suicide attempts, but the big one was, I'm in my house and the counselor's coming, you know, the counselor comes to see her and the counselor's coming in the house and she says, um, hi, how are you? This is all okay. She said, I said, she's in the back. I wouldn't let them have their sessions around me because it would distract the, the, my youngest daughter, Ashley. And it was like, oh, yay, I could stay home today. Um, I have time with her because... The mentor is here. So the mentor goes in the room and she comes back out. She says, well, she's sound asleep. I said, they can't be. She was just in here. No, she's pretty asleep. I said, what do you mean she's pretty asleep? And my baby looks up and says, she took my medicine. I said, she did what? She took the medicine. The medicine, man. The medicine, mommy. Over there. And she points to the counter where her medication was literally for double pneumonia, completely empty the bottle. So I go running in her room and I look and I said, Tiffany, her eyes are rolling back up in her head. She's starting to seize them like foam. And I tell the mentor, call 911. I'm leaving. I threw her over my shoulder, called the neighbor, go with her, down to the hospital. And uh, she was almost comatose. They had to put charcoal in her. And yeah, she drank a bottle of um, medication or the youngest one's double pneumonia. The worst experience in my life was flying down the road. The police knew what was going on. They, the next thing you know, they showed up behind me with lights flashing. It was, it, you couldn't believe like 20 police carts escorted me to that hospital because I wasn't waiting for an ambulance. You know, because they, I wait for an ambulance, she could be gone by then, you know, and I just couldn't, I was, I panicked. And so the policeman said, well, the next time you should wait for us to come. No, I won't be waiting for anybody. You, I, here, here's the story. I need help. So that was the beginning of getting a whole lot more help. But like I said, what you have now in the system of care, I always say it and I'll say it for the rest of my life. I believe my daughter started these wraparound processes because the amount of money that the state of New Jersey spent on hospitalizations for her has got to be at least three quarters of uh, the dollars less bringing the services to your house. Wow, Shauna. 
Thank you very much for all that information. And now we kind of gonna switch a little bit so like that we have everything. <laughs> uh, Shana, let's talk about Tiffany's today and also Shona, the grandmother, raising grandchildren. Okay, well, that's the hard part, everybody. I want you to understand that <clears throat> Tiffany um, uh, had, a, had a baby and the state would not let her take her baby home. So I was not letting the state take her baby because he was her life. So I took him. So now me and Ashley have become the caregivers. So now we have this infant and Tiffany, who's not allowed to even live in the house with this infant. So she, uh, she, she excelled for a little while. She had two other children who were with her. At the age, uh, she had ended up having these three children. Uh, they were one and a half, two and a half and five. And their father, who was the nurturer, died suddenly within three weeks of being ill. And uh, now the state wants to take all the kids because you're looking at somebody with a disorder who is emotionally challenged to begin with, who is moving from state to state, she became an actual train wreck. And I had decided that you, nobody in any state is going to decide when she can get to see her children. They already lost their father and I refused to let them lose their mother. And so I took them, I took all of them. They are now 14, 15 and 18. And I just recently reunified the 14 year old little girl with her mother. And I, I, I did have my selfish reasons for that because the little girl was becoming, the 14 year old was becoming uh, another Tiffany, like looking in another mirror. And I said, Tiffany, <clears throat> back at you. It's time for you to take your daughter. And so she said, for real, can I have her? Sure. We went back to the court system and reunified her with her mother. And uh, she's doing wonderful, she is. But the method for that madness was to be honest, if she needed services, she's in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So she could get the help that she would need. So, yep. We are so happy, you know, like uh, we can share all this information. And, and Shona, I'm so grateful for you to be here with us and telling every single, you know, like everyone in here your story, because I know, you know, that must be really overwhelmed for you at this moment, having to relieve everything. But we, you know, there is not enough thank you that we can say. To yeah, I, I just want to mention one thing that is kind of important to me. A youth with challenging behaviors, the reason that, I, and I see, I see this, Somebody that has that behavior, which is very challenging and they do ha have emotional challenges, it's very hard for them to nurture an infant or a baby. They can't give that hug and that, that, that nurturing effect. I, I don't think that it's because they don't want to. <clears throat> I just don't think they can. And I've always said that Tiffany is a wonderful mother, but she's not a nurturing mother. Their father was that nurturing person. And he made me promise him that I would always look after his children. And that was why I took them. I didn't take them from the state. I actually went to court with Tiffany and we decided that in the best interest of the children that she would allow me to have them. I didn't plan on having them for that many years, but <laughs> it is what it is. But, um, it all turned out so well in the end yeah. that it, 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 it's the, the book is still not done because I do have other books that says Tiffany D and me. Uh, the battle is not over. The battle with this, with my Tiffany, honestly, she's 36, but the battle's not over because you we are now at 36 years old. You still go through some life experiences. So I will always worry about her. You know, I always will not put my guard down. 
that's another thing that we want to highlight today because sometimes we see caregivers out there having challenges and the perception might be totally different from their reality. So would you please go into that a little bit? Because yeah. yeah, because in, re in reality, you're never finished with this, this situation. It, it, it doesn't end, you know? The whole thing is, is you, you have to be in it to win it. When, when you have a child, it, you, you have all these books, they say what to expect when you're expecting and you wanna find names and everything else. But there ain't no book out there that tells you what to do when you're expecting and your child ends up with emotional challenges. If a child has a physical disability, you can see that. But if a child has an emotional instability, you can't see that. Nor can you even phantom, you know, a child being unhappy. You know, just because a child doesn't wear a smile on their face doesn't mean they're unhappy. But if a child is smiling all the time, you never know. And that was the thing. She was always laughing or smiling. She never had a frown. You know, she was just bubbly little girl. And so it is hard to see depression. You can't see it. You can't hear it. You can't smell it. But it is there. It's, um, she would tell me, um, <clears throat> I ask her all the time when we're at dinners. So, you know, when these things were going on, how did you feel? And she would look at me in my face and say, I don't know. I don't remember. So I'm thinking I'm 65. She's only 36. How she ain't remembering? And I can remember everything. Me and my other daughter would sit there and tell her some of the things that she would do. And she's very clearly looks at me and tells me she doesn't remember. Some circumstances she does, but some she does not. And we can't forget, you know? This is also, um, you know, because we're trying to cover a lot in here, but we also are trying to illustrate uh, the thought of not seeing others in a judgmental way but more in a way that how can I help, you know, right, Shauna? Yeah, yeah. You 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 always have to <clears throat> think about if you're you're seeing a child really struggling, you're, you're seeing a child struggling in a store or or at a school or or one of your children's friends, you should reach out to that parent. Because if the child is having problems and you see it. It is everybody's responsibility to talk to a parent. We have support groups. You know, we have a lot of support. We have a lot of stuff going on at FSO. And um, there's no way that somebody can be left behind without their voices being heard. We have warm lines when you get yourself into a pickle and you need to talk to somebody. There are phone numbers that you can call. There are people always able to talk to you. And, and you just can't do this by yourself. Don't, I, my biggest suggestion is don't try to do this by yourself. You can't fix it. But what you can do is empower yourself. Yeah. You can encourage yourself and empower yourself and then empower somebody else. It's, it's very real. It's very emotional. The battle never ends, but you're the beginning of the battle. And it is time for everybody to wake up and help each other. I see the times flying. Uh, however, I want to remind everybody uh, the link for Family Partners website we will be below the video. And if you have a question, it's okay. You can just reach out to us. Um, sometimes we might not have the answer and it's okay too, because what we do is we're gonna explore all the resources in the community that can help. So it's okay, just reach out and uh, you are not alone. That's what we want you to know. Uh, I know we need to allow time for families and providers and uh, the people attending uh, this presentation to ask their questions. So um, I just wanna conclude by saying thank you very much, Shona. We definitely appreciate that you are here, you know, just uh, talking to us about your story and uh, we are very grateful for that. And I also want to thank every, every single person in here, you know, for joining us. Uh, and we're going to allow time for you guys to ask your questions. So thank you. Thank you very much to everyone.
I'm just going to start the recorder right now. Uh, Shana, you want to say another word before we? Yeah, I do. Um, first of all, I'm looking at all these compliments coming through the chat line, and thank you so much. Um, you're all my world. You're my world. You're the world that I wanted to talk to. I want to talk to parents. I want everybody to understand that if you don't hear this from another parent, who cares? You know, it's like, I know I had a lot of professionals in my life and I advise everybody to keep those professionals in your life, involve yourself in the child's life. And um, sharing my story is not just sharing a story. Sharing my story is my mission. And, and I just hope that everybody got something out of it. Thank you. I see Shona. I also want to uh, tell you this, Shona. I see in the chat also a lot of people writing. Thank you, Shona, for sharing. Yeah. You are an incredible woman. Uh, those with emotional disability is a hiding person. Um, what else is in here? Uh, we have a lot of thank you for sure. Yeah. I'm so happy that you are here. So we really, really appreciate that you're taking the time to do this with us. So thank you very much. So now I'm going to stop the recorder and we're going to allow time for you guys to ask your questions. And we are very excited and happy for having everyone in here. So thank you very much.